All right, well, good evening. My name is Annette Reguette, and I am the Vice President of the Harvard Kennedy School Black Alumni Association. Welcome, everyone. Building on legacy, vision, and dedication of past leaders of the Black Alumni Association, and on behalf of my fellow executive officers, I am pleased that you have joined us for the second annual Black History Month State of Leadership Dialogue. Black History Month is a time in the United States to honor the significant and often overlooked contributions that people of the African diaspora have made to the evolution of the United States. This is a time of collective purposeful focus on examining the essential role of African-Americans in developing the history, the conscience, and the moral fiber of our country and its people. We rejoice in the progress of black people as they act within the interconnected goals of freedom, equality, and justice. And we celebrate notable figures in black history, especially the black firsts like Anthony and Mary Johnson, and if you don't know, they were the first African-Americans to own land in these United States. That was in 1640. Thomas Jennings, W.B. Du Bois, Hattie McDaniel, Jackie Robinson, Marian Anderson, Gillian Bluford and Mae Jemison, Thurgood Marshall, Colin Powell, Robert L. Johnson, Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, and Katanji Brown Jackson, to name but a few. Now, I love to speak their names. But it is, this is a time for us to not only study and honor the past, but also to examine and build our future, a future toward that more perfect union that Harvard alum, President Obama talked about in 2008. And there's no better place than the Harvard Kennedy School of Government to have these oftentimes controversial and sometimes even contentious, but always necessary conversations. It is at the Kennedy School where students, scholars, and practitioners from every mountain and valley come to ask themselves, what can you do? The Kennedy School is where we come to understand and to explore how we move from challenges and dreams to solutions and strategies. Maya Angelou said, wouldn't it be wonderful when Black history and Native American history and Jewish history and all of the U.S. history is taught from one book, just U.S. history. But as yet in 2023, 20 states have introduced legislation to keep critical race theory out of classrooms and teaching Black history has been legally banned in seven U.S. states as history that makes people uncomfortable. As uncomfortable as it may be, the Kennedy School introduced a required core course entitled Race and Racism in the Making of the United States as a Global Power. Last year at a BAA virtual event, we all had the privilege of receiving an abridged version of that class by Professor Khalil Muhammad, who teaches it. Every year, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History chooses a theme around which to center their Black History Month celebrations. The theme for 2023 is Black resistance in the past, present, and future. We embrace that theme here today as we discuss the state of leadership. The Honorable Deval Patrick, former governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, was our keynote speaker for the inaugural state of leadership event. And he is back again, this time to moderate, and we are grateful for his consistent support. He will engage in what is sure to be a meaningful and lively dialogue with former Federal Communications Commissioner, Michael K. Powell. But before I tell you more about our guests this evening, please allow me to introduce the Harvard Kennedy School Dean, Doug Ellendorf, who has also been a steadfast supporter of the BAA. Dean Douglas W. Ellendorf began his tenure as Dean of Harvard Kennedy School in January of 2016. He had been a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute after serving as the director of the Congressional Budget Office. From, 20, from 2009 through March of 2015. Before CBO, he spent two years at Brookings where he was a senior fellow, the Edward M. Bernstein Scholar and the director of the Hamilton Project. He was previously an assistant professor at Harvard University, a principal analyst at CBO, a senior uh, economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors, Deputy Assistant Director for Economic Policy at the Treasury Department and Assistant Director of the Division of Research and Statistics at the Federal Reserve Board. In those positions, Dean Ellendorf worked on budget policy 
healthcare issues, the macroeconomic effects of fiscal policy, social security, income security programs, financial markets, macroeconomics analysis, and forecasting. He earned his PhD and AM in economics from Harvard University, where he was the National Science Foundation graduate fellow, and his AB summa cum laude from Princeton University. Dean, you are certainly jamming an awful lot into one lifetime. <laughs> Please share with us your remarks this evening. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, wonderful to join all of you who are with us tonight, and certainly my uh, colleague, uh, Deval Patrick, uh, and Michael Powell. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective on uh, very interesting challenges in the world. Um, let me, I'll, I'll be very brief so we can get to the main event. Um, we have um, a lot going on at the Kennedy School all the time. I wanna highlight three, three topics quickly. Um, one is, as I think you all know, we have a new president of the university beginning on July 1st, uh, Claudine Gay. Uh, she is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. Um, and we are very lucky that she will be the next president of the university. Um, she is an academic star um, winning prizes all along her, her, her academic progression. Um, she has a very wise dean. When the deans gather together to talk about various topics at Harvard, which we do fairly often, uh, she is the best of us. And, um, and she's also, besides being an academic star and a wise dean, she is just a wonderful person. Uh, and those of you who have not had a chance to meet her, um, we'll try to, Rudy and I have talked about uh, conspiring to bring her to this group. Uh, certainly, she'll be. Uh, she's a fan of the work of the Kennedy School, um, so you'll get a chance to meet her. Um, and she is the first Black president of Harvard University. She is the daughter of uh, Haitian immigrants to this country, uh, spent a number of her early years living in Saudi Arabia, where her father was working. Um, so we are, we are in for, uh, our current president is terrific, and his predecessor was terrific, um, but I'm very excited about what, uh, what Claudine can bring to the university. Uh, the second topic I wanna to just mention is the incredible amount of research and teaching and outreach on race and public policy that's now happening at the Kennedy School. Um, you mentioned, Annette, the new course that we have in the MPP core curriculum. That course, a lot of other work, is enabled by the recruitment of faculty members that we've been able to do over the last several years. People from a number of different disciplines looking from their own perspective at some aspect of race and public policy. Um, there's a terrific essay written by um, our colleagues in the communications uh, group, um, now available on our website. And I can send Annette, maybe you the link if you'd like to send it to others, that tries to summarize as best it can in a few pages, the array of work happening. But I'm thinking of things like uh, our new faculty member, Sandra Susan Smith's work on uh, criminal justice, uh, Desmond Ang's work on um, early aspects of racism in this country, uh, early early 20th century aspects of racism and how they how they have played out over time. Um, uh, Cornell William Brooks, former president of NAACP, now in our faculty. I just came from a panel panel discussion. He was talking about religion in American life. Um, Marcel Olson's work on health care uh, disparities in this country. Latanya Sweeney's work on um, all the bad things that can happen online, in particular some issues she works on regarding race, uh, Robert Livingston's work. So across um, a set of people, we have great, great and important work going on for our students and for the broader world. The third thing I wanted to highlight, particularly because people on the call can be helpful here, is admissions of students. Um, we, are we will be announcing um, who is admitted to the school um, in March, uh, it's a little earlier than last year. We were too late last year, really, to catch the market at the right time. So we've compressed our schedule. We'll be announcing in March. Um, and it's really important that we lure into the school uh, all the students whom we admit. And we are working with uh, student caucuses around the school um, uh, to make sure that they can help from a student to student perspective. But alumni can be very valuable in this as well. Um, so I think you all know a crucial part of our new admits day is the connection with the Black Policy Conference. I met a couple of weeks ago with our students who are leading the conference this year. They are just terrific. Um, they have a lot of, a lot of ambitious plans. Um, 
And Deval and others here at the school are trying to help them put these plans into practice by, by the end of March. And um, I'm very excited about that as, as part of the as part of our, of our admissions and recruitment process. But please do help us yourselves by, um, by getting the word out to people you, you may know who get admitted that this is a place for them um, and we want them here. So let me stop there, Net, and I'm happy to take questions about anything if people have them, but I also, I like many of you, want to hear from, um, from Deval and Michael Powell. So it's up to you. All right. Well, I think maybe we'll save our questions to the end and folks can have questions for you as well. Dean, if that's all right. Um, thank you so much for those uh, comments. I always love hearing your updates because um, I always learn something and um, I'm always inspired by it. So uh, thank you for the updates and also for the reminder of another Black first, Claudine Gay, who I should have included uh, my earlier remarks. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. All right, so now it is just truly my honor to um, introduce uh, our uh, uh, panel members Panel members this evening. Um, first, we have um, Deval Patrick. He is the co-director of the Center for Public Leadership and a professor of practice at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also a senior advisor uh, to Bain Capital and co-chair of American Bridge 21st Century Foundation which is a progressive political action committee. He is the founder and from uh, 2015 to 2019 was managing partner of Bain Capital, Double Impact, a growth equity fund that invests in commercial businesses for both competitive financial returns and positive social impact. From 2007 to 2015, he served as governor of Massachusetts. He has been a senior executive in two Fortune 50 companies, a partner in two Boston law firms, and by appointment of President Bill Clinton, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the United States Justice Department. He is a Rockefeller Fellow, a Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute, and the author of two books. Governor Patrick earned his AB cum laude from Harvard College and his JD from Harvard Law School. We are very um, thrilled that you're going to be here to moderate this discussion, Governor. Thank you so kindly. Thank you, Annette. All right. And now um, we have um, my, my, my great honor to introduce um, our, uh, our keynote for this evening, who is Michael K. Powell. He is the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton in 1970, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm making you older than you are, in 1997 and appointed uh, chairman by President George W. Bush in 2001, and he served until 2005. Uh, during his time as FCC chair, Chairman Powell oversaw the rapid transformation of communications markets into the digital age. During his tenure, the internet came into widespread commercial use, uh, as did smartphones, Wi-Fi networks, and satellite radio. In his current role as president and CEO of NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, Mr. Powell leads one of the largest trade associations in Washington, D.C., representing the communications and content industries. Prior public service includes chief of staff of the antitrust division of the uh, Department of Justice, policy advisor to the Secretary of Defense, and service as an armored cavalry officer in the U.S. Army. In the private sector, he practiced law and was a senior advisor in the private equity firm. Chairman Powell also served on the public boards of Cisco and AOL. He is the son of former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. All right. Now, the, the 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 Black Alumni Association really is is honored to sponsor this Black History Month of Leadership Dialogue, and it is dedicated to W. E. Du Bois, who received his doctorate from Harvard in 1895. And so, with that, now I'll turn it over to you, um, Governor, if you'd like to get our conversation going with uh, excellent the one and only Michael Powell. The one and only. Thank you so much, Annette. You know, you 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 gave a lot of uh, of Michael's extraordinary background, but you left out that he is also a Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute, and we ah, were in the same class. Um, wow. So we go back that a couple of decades. All right. uh, now, so this is this is a fun assignment for me, and Michael, it's wonderful to see you, and thank you uh, for participating. I wanted to start. You know, I love your father too. Um, uh, but you are a leader in your own right. 
and some of your leadership journey um, stems from setback and uh, and a painful one, uh, and uh, and the resilience you learned from that. I wonder if you could start by telling that story, if that's okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. And Governor, I'm honored you you take the time to uh, to have this discussion with me. Um, Come on, you give me a hard time if I said no. You absolutely would, absolutely <laughs> would. Although I'm starting to have Harvard alumni and be here on this call. <laughs> so we'll leave that for another day. You know, um, I'll try to make it brief, but it is probably the most seminal event of my life. So um, it definitely is an emotional topic for me. You know, I went to college on an Army ROTC scholarship, fully intending to follow my father's footsteps as an Army officer. I loved it. It was my passion. I, I did graduate high in my class. I went on to be an armored gallery officer in Germany. Uh, literally was having the time of my life um, doing the vocation that I had always dreamed of. Uh, and we were out on a, um, a combat uh, exercise, um, renaissance, uh, uh, not renaissance, uh, 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 reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, that's the word. Uh, and we were coming back uh, in a convoy of Jeeps at about 60 miles an hour on the German Autobahn and my driver lost full control of the Jeep, swerved into oncoming traffic. We rolled over at about 60 miles an hour. I was thrown into the highway. The Jeep landed on me and it shattered my pelvic cradle completely off my spine, uh, an injury that typically you cannot survive miraculously. Uh, was able to be picked up, taken to the hospital, uh, surgery, um, ultimately flown back to the United States and spent one year of my life uh, in Walter Reed Army Medical Center, uh, getting put back together, um, watching the innovation of brilliant physicians who had never seen an injury quite like that, didn't quite know what the answer was, but innovated. I uh, had the courage to make difficult choices with my parents and me, and uh, ultimately a 17 hour surgery pinned it all together um, in a very complex way. Uh, and about a year later, uh, after about 17 surgeries, uh, I was able to leave, uh, leave the hospital. But one thing that was a casualty, not only my physical health, but my career was over. You know, I remember the saddest day is when an army colonel walked into my hospital room and said, you know, Lieutenant, with all due respect, you're, we have to process you out of the army for disability. That hurt more than the injuries hurt. It was, it was everything I ever wanted, uh, everything I ever dreamed of. Um, but life's what happens, um, you know, while you're going along, these kinds of unexpected intrusions do happen. So it was, it was a lot of lessons and adaptation and resilience um, it was a lot of lessons in the meaning of life. Uh, you know, I was instantly exposed to the fragility uh, of life, the finitude of life, uh, that every day has more meaning than you ever uh, recognize or accept. Uh, it taught me about the importance of eschewing negative people uh, who are draining and cause suffering in your life. I have very little room or patience for them. Um, and it really kind of restored my my faith in humanity, watching the caregivers and family surround me to, to, to put me on a new path. So, you know, out I came and I had to start all over. And it's also about how do you learn how to start all over? And mm -hmm. I think these are very powerful leadership lessons, but more importantly, they're lessons in being a, a fully, fully formed human being, I think, in a world that's full of chaos and randomness uh, and disappointment and suffering and great joy. And, and how do you navigate that for yourself and for the people you lead, uh, I think is the lesson we're all trying to lead. I wish I hadn't learned it the way I had at the age of 25, mm -hmm. but to this day, I say it's probably the most important thing that ever happened to me uh, and probably more to do with who I am today than anything that's ever happened to me. Michael, thank you. I, I know that story and I, I, I hope you don't mind my no, going no. so personal so early, but I think it's, it's really important for our, our guests to... Uh, to have that context, it goes so deep, and it was, as you said, so formidable um, for you. Um, your dad spoke about and wrote about leadership. Um, he had a lot of lessons he offered. Um, his his he was a living example 
of, uh, of those lessons. Was there one in particular that had an impact on you? That's a challenging question. You know, I think what comes to my mind immediately is I think he would say character matters. Um, having a moral center matters. Being mm -hmm. a person of principle matters. That, that history really evolves more through the actions of people than any other systematic systemic effect. You know, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, there's, there is no history, only biography in some sense. And so the quality of the people who endeavor to change the world matters a lot. Um, and I think he tried to teach us that part of leadership is perfecting your humanity. You know, mm -hmm. you know as we like to say in our family, not just to do good, but to be good uh, and to uh, separate your own self-ego from your identity. You know, he used to say, you know, um, one of the 13 rules was, you know, don't hold your ego uh, on your job. When you lose your job, you'll lose your self-esteem, you know, understanding mm -hmm. that, that meaning and purpose uh, come from other things than titles, wealth, power, and fame. Uh, and that if you are committed to service uh, and unmotivated principally by those things, you, you will be a better leader, but more importantly, you'll be a better father, a better husband, a better son, and a better friend. Uh, and, and, and one day on your deathbed, uh, as he said to me on his, uh, these are the things you'll be most remembered for. Mm. You know, I, I, these are uh, transcendent um, lessons. They are hard ones to, to, to hold on to in Washington. Yeah. You know, it's a, we, I think I told you once that when I, uh, we don't have, term limits as you know in in massachusetts i have a term limit named diane and she said two terms and that's it and uh good one. she said about yeah right yeah uh, she said about jobs like uh like the one i had and the one you had at the fcc you have to you have to you have to leave them while you still remember how to open your own door right there's a there's a thing that happens in uh in washington that is that makes the that attaches the ego to the job. So incredibly mm. important that your dad kept uh, kept that lesson and others top of mind in that environment in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I read something that you um, that you said in remarks in 2022 um, at a, a diversity pipeline program, uh, and I want to quote them for everybody. Um, if you're like me, and I think in this respect you are, you hate having yourself quoted to you. <laughs> Um, but I just want you to elaborate on it a little bit. You wrote, um, uh, the information age is the first great epic that holds genuine promise for black and brown people to share in the fruits, uh, to share in its fruits and riches. My ancestors were picking cotton in the agricultural age and were left out. And they were legally segregated in the industrial age and again left out. The information age provides the first real chance to get in. While plenty of obstacles remain for minorities and women, I might add, one can see the viability of success more clearly than ever before. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, I believe the, the world does evolve through, you know, meaningful socioeconomic epics. Um, and I think that it is a blessing uh, if you were born in a time where that is transforming uh, into an epic that will define civilization, society, economy uh, for the next hundred years, if not more. And all of us here have the blessing of having witnessed the uh, curtain rising on the third great wave of, the, of, of, of mankind. And I, I've always been struck by how many structural and systematic things prevented uh, black and brown folks from having any real meaningful opportunity to participate in the fruits uh, of those transformations. Mm -hmm. And that as we came into the information age, um, not all is rosy, but there is a couple of advantages that never existed before. The first is just the absence of legal and structural segregation in the legally systematic sense um, that existed in both of those uh, periods. Um, slavery and Jim Crow laws, uh, most notably. Um, 
Also, the, there are aspects of technology that have lowered the barriers to entry for a lot of businesses and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at what it took to be successful in the age of agriculture uh, or industrial agriculture uh, or in the industrial age, I mean, this was the business of enormous wealth, enormous family advantage, enormous uh, infrastructure. You know, the famous quote about, you know, the first, you know, freedom of the press is great for those who, can, who, who own a printing press, you know, but all mm. of a sudden every American owns a printing press. Every American has a dramatically lower barrier to being able to create, um, to innovate, to participate, to find uh, a global diaspora of customers, uh, I think, and to put those together in ways that allow uh, those people in there uh, future generations to prosper and benefit from this age. Um, mm -hmm. But we can't let it slip by. I don't either take it for advantage. You know, I, I push my children very hard to become technologically literate, to be conversant in the language that this era will reward um, so that they can be full participants of it. You know, I worry that we don't have an education system keeping, you know, our black and brown children up to speed uh, in order to participate in the various waves of undulation in this process. But, you know, on balance, I still think it's a heck of a lot better uh, than the two previous eras. And we should act with some, I think, urgency and moment uh, about the opportunities that exist, the fresh opportunities uh, that didn't exist in the past. Do you do, what do you say to your kids um, uh, being technologically proficient means? Yeah, I, I do think of it a lot like a language. I think there are some fundamentals to being fluent in how uh, computer-based technological systems work. That's not the same as being a coder or a programmer per se, but having a fluency and familiarity uh, with the interaction of software with hardware and the ways that it's evolving. Um, to keep up with as a part of current affairs, a part of your learning and growth and reading with the latest developments. I would say right now, for example, I would be pushing them, what do you think about ChatGPT? What do you think about right. Microsoft's latest announcement? What do you mm -hmm. think this is gonna take us? What do you think the world looks like in 10 years? You know, mm -hmm. to be literate in that way um, and to confront your weaknesses in this era. You know, uh, I like to say, I don't speak math all that well, uh, mm -hmm. But I've made a concerted effort to have a better understanding of what an algorithm really is and mm -hmm. what kind of power it confirms on those who deploy them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit of that. Um, and it's a little bit of get your hands dirty and play with the stuff. Um, so you just, uh, you know, you, you know, you have the basic skills of a, of a 21st century, you know, Renaissance person. Mm. I'm going to I'm going to bring others in in a minute, but I it, there's a dark side here, too. Right. I mean, there's a there's a there are ways in which um, social media has made all voices um, accessible, um, but in some cases amplifies outrage and not um, and not all voices equally. Is that fair? And how should if it how should we think about this today? Yeah, it's 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 beyond fair, uh, particularly the critique of social media, and I think the, you know, the core products that are currently front and center in so many of the tech companies today. I, I personally am of the view they are a net negative to society at the moment, uh, a net negative to democracy at the moment. Uh, I do not think that they've proven yet that their their value in human connection and human. Uh, communication and human speech uh, have outweighed uh, the the negative consequences that they have have infected the society with, um, and I think that if you understand the the technology and the models on which they're built on, you will understand they are inherently built to take advantages of the worst parts of our nature, not the best parts mm -hmm. of our nature. Um, you know, they are tools that depend on mass surveillance of all of our behavior across a, a myriad of platforms. It is not an exaggeration to know these, say these systems know you better than you know yourself. They know your tells, they know your patterns. Um, and because you're fueled by an advertising model, uh, selling ever more granular psychographic profiles 
of people to the highest bidder is the model. Um, and I do think that that uh, puts a high premium on keeping people glued and engaged. And we've learned that the alligator brain tends to get glued and engaged to much more negative things than it does to positive things. And so I think what we're seeing proliferating throughout society, extremism, hate, misinformation, I think these things, it is, you cannot excuse the tools. You know, as Marshall McLuhan said, the media can be the message. I mean, I think the mm. tools do contribute uh, to those things, finding fertile ground uh, to society, bending in those directions that are so far unhealthy. And this is before mm -hmm. we start, and I'll stop but talking about the, the deep uh, unhealthy nature that's happening to our kids. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the suicide rate of young people, particularly girls, teenage girls, is just terrifying. It should be treated as a public health disaster. Um, and a lot of it can be traced um, to you know, the arrival of the like button and the retweet button and the, the, the self-image um, judgments that go on with that. I mean, I just think that we're just now starting to understand the harm we're doing to our kids uh, and to our society and our government. And, you know, I think it's an incumbent on all of us to continue to work to, to hope these things can live up to their better nature. What, what should good leaders um, striving simultaneously to be good people, what, what should we do about this in our own lives and as a policy matter and um, as leaders? Well, there's so many answers to that question, but you know, there's a little bit of a sort of rage against the siren song that this stuff draws you towards, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all designed to affect kind of, you know, our evolutionary preferences for, you know, you know, power, fame, celebrity, and status. And, you know, you, a minute ago, we were talking about the importance of being people of principle, moral character, you know, mm -hmm. um, do we reward substance over celebrity? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Is personal branding more important than, you know, personal principle? Is, mm -hmm. is, you know, we say we want moderates, but do we reward them politically mm -hmm. or, or do we not? Uh, we say we, you know, certain people say, I won't, I won't be political, but oh, we hate Donald Trump, but they watch everything Donald Trump does and says, like it's mm -hmm. a television show. If you yep. reward people with the attention uh, and the retweeting and the conversation and the celebrity that's associated with that behavior, you'll get more of that behavior. I think it's incumbent mm -hmm. on us as citizens who believe in a higher purpose, a greater honor and greater grace. Uh, I simply do not let my life get oriented around the, si the silly circus. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't watch them on TV. I don't participate in it online. I don't contribute my own self to those things. And I push my own sons and, and students that I work with to, to, to read more deeply, more reflectively, uh, uh, and get out of the shallows constantly that so much of these platforms, I think, reward. Is there a role of, I mean, I hear the point about um, the, the balance we impose on our, on our own behavior, mm -hmm. um, the discipline that we should bring um, to, you know, putting aside the, uh, the onslaught of, uh, of, of negativism uh, and superficiality. Is there a policy position um, here? Is that a bridge too far for um, uh, for this <laughs> for this forum uh, for someone who has a has a role um, through uh, uh, through uh, your trade association? Yeah, I, I, look, I think that we we should be honest. There's no quick policy magic bullet, but policy is reflective of the values of our society. And mm -hmm. you know, if these values that are being venerated are troublesome, then, then policy does have a role. You can think about a couple of ways that it manifests itself. One would be, what is the nation's privacy policies? Mm -hmm. what, what are the policies about when you can be appropriately collecting you know, everything in my trash can and every step I take and every move I make in my car, and when can't you? And, and what kind of permission do you have to have acquired from me to do that? Or, mm -hmm. or am I just subject to your continuous surveillance without any authority or control under the law? 
You know, the mm -hmm. United States is one of the few countries in, in, in the industrialized world that doesn't have national privacy statutes addressing this yet. And there's a lot of work going on in Congress allegedly to address this, but this is something we're well behind on. Antitrust policy, you know, when are these companies too big? You know, I mm -hmm. was in the antitrust division at the Department of Justice. And, you know, these companies are very problematic from traditional antitrust laws because they, do, they give us these goodies for free. There are no price effects. The Chicago School of Antitrust is very heavily focused on measuring harm to consumers through pricing. But when, mm -hmm. when Google's free and Facebook's free, you have no price effects. You need to evolve that scholarship and that policy to address when someone has hegemony over a data reservoir that allows them to control or gatekeep or um, predict and manipulate the behavior of people. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do our laws about when is something too big kick in? Those laws are in need of a, a meaningful evolution. Um, I do think that, you know, are there consequences for misinformation? You know, watching the whole hand wringing of Elon Musk and Twitter over whether Trump's on the platform, off the platform, you know, that's a tough thing for private companies to be trying to, to navigate. But, you know, look, is the intentional use of uh, uh, of proof, demonstrable misinformation in order to execute, you know, a certain behavior, you know, is that lawful or unlawful? Are there boundaries to that that we will not tolerate? You know, we, we certainly have plenty of incidents that these things have led people to shoot, kill, maim. Uh, school shootings often can find their route every single time on the internet and social media somewhere. Um, yeah. Does Facebook have some obligation with respect to that young person who's probably dropping those breadcrumbs all over their platform. And I would submit yeah. they can probably see earlier than most. Yeah. They have some affirmative obligation to, to raise that flag or do something. So again, I, I don't have pat policy answers, but I think there's a whole panoply of policies that could incent companies. And these are good companies. Could you incent them to design their products differently uh, and to avoid the societal consequences uh, that I think they're morally obligated to attune to. Do you think, has social media um, just reflected the, the issues around race in America or contributed to them in some way? Mm, that's a challenging question. I, I think for me, and, and I think you could argue about this, I think it contributes. Um, you know, I think that human beings are complicated. And I mm -hmm. think that um, they are, you know, there's a lot of great research about our cognitive biases and things that will <laughs> cause us to do things. We all know, for example, that if you get in a crowd big enough and it's the wrong crowd and the wrong energy gets going, a lot of good people will do bad things in that crowd, mm -hmm. right? If the crowd offers its approval, if the crowd offers condemnation, if you don't go along, if the crowd says it was okay to do this, um, people do will change behaviors. They will find behaviors acceptable and unacceptable uh, because of the feedback they get from, from a crowd. The internet is a really huge crowd. Not to mm -hmm. mention we have our own demons, right? We, we wrestle internally continuously with what we think is right and what we think is wrong or, or our desire to be wealthy or our desire to be noticed, our desire can lead us. I mean, Duvall, you've seen many a good politician who just, just couldn't resist taking the, the football tickets, just couldn't get off that airplane that they should have never been on. You know, these things mm -hmm. happen slowly by accretion because mm -hmm. you are motivated to feel important to have high status, to have achievement, to have power, to have money. And I think those things create all kinds of temptations. And I think these platforms can exacerbate those temptations because we, you know, we respond to fear uh, and we respond to, you know, pleasure. Yes, yes, yes. You know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, narrative out there, I suppose, from some of the folks who were worried uh, about some of the things you described, that we're at a an Orwellian 1984 stage where, uh, where you know, large uh, groups of people can be manipulated 
intentionally through uh, um, uh, misinformation or disinformation, I, I, I should say. Are you are you there, or do you think that happens, or is it more um, the kind of a you know herd mentality? We kind of drift in these uh, directions, and then and then bad things happen. In other words, do you do you sense that there's a there's a hand or two um, that is uh, not just predictive in the ways that you describe the big companies, but is intentional about using these tools to drive uh, drive us apart, frankly. Oh, well, I, I I think there's no question about it. I mean, I think these things are beginning to be seen and studied. I mean, what is January 6th? Yes. I mean, what 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 is Charlottesville? Mm -hmm. What what is any number of the school shootings we found so horrific, where did they start? Um, you know, I remember reading about one of these tragic kids and I, you know, even though they're murderers, I find them tragic, you know, who was a 4.0 student living their life, went down some rabbit hole and went to California, shot up a synagogue. How did that happen? Mm. Um, you know, we, we, we are seeing real world effects of what's happening online and to be naive about that or say, oh, well, you know, guns don't, you know, people don't shoot people, you know, whatever that silly yeah, phrase is right. about, you yeah. know, that, that yeah. somehow that one. these things can't have an effect or a force, I think is just uh, wrong and demonstrably wrong. You know, when you read the, you know, the January 6th report, I haven't finish the whole thing. But, you know, look, you just cannot help but see the internet fueled aspects of that right. taking root, the misinformation that becomes truth to this community, you know, the, the justifications that become and are push people intentionally pushing those buttons every day. Every day. Every yeah. single minute of every day, there are people willing to go out there and push those buttons. What's um, the way back? Yeah. I, I wish I had an easy answer to that. I, I like to believe that things start with deepening our awareness, mm -hmm. deepening our recognition that this is, this is not abstract, this is real. Then trying to understand and diagnose, well, what are the causative effects? Like what is causing, you know, why does, if a young girl commits suicide on such, let's go understand what happened and why and how could that have been, you know, so there's a diagnostic phase, which I think the society is sort of in. Mm -hmm. And then I think there is an incumbency on institutions, including families and parents and churches, and, you know, to begin to try to talk openly about these things and instill alternative ways of being so that these things are less seductive, less powerful in their hold on us and that we can find meaning in our lives without resorting to some of the things that these things promise us. But that's not mm -hmm. easy. And I don't pretend it's easy. It's a life's work for many generations, I think. I, I'm, I see Annette is here. And I think we're going to go to uh, questions from our, uh, our guests in just a second. But can I just ask one more, Annette, before we do? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, organize a uh, a project. I say it that, that way, a research project. I say it that way because we really are in the stages of trying to understand the question to uh, to ask uh, around how we defend democratic ideals and the processes of democracy uh, itself um, in a language that actually resonates, because the 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 sort of motivation of uh, uh, narratives around the, you know, the American dream, opportunity, and equality, and fair play, don't seem to resonate in quite the same way they did when you and I were coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and for, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. But I wonder if you see that, um, if you are sensing that, and what uh, advice you would give me and others who are looking for the right language to use to engage people on um, uh, on the question of the of, of how to make democracy meaningful, not just functional, but meaningful. Yeah, I mean, I, this is a great project. And I, I'd love to think deeply about that with you. Um, you know, I'd only say a few things. Um, um, you know, I tend to think of democracy less as a form of government 
and more as a, as a dispute resolution mechanism for a multicultural society that by its venerated commitment to the First Amendment allows all views to speak. Mm -hmm. And in a world where all views can speak, you have a world in which our views have the opportunity to be persuasive. All views have an opportunity to create movements and opportunities to obtain political power. I've never been naive enough to believe that liberal democracy, which many of us cherish, is an absolute promise of democracy generally. I think it's a, it's a form of democracy some of us prefer, but there are other illiberal forms of democracy. And you, you hear some people talking about that, even in the United States, you hear the Hungarians talk about it, uh, Oban and others, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have a different kind of democracy. And in a free mm -hmm. society with free speech, you always have this risk. But the thing that we commit ourselves to is that we play the game. You, you know, you're free to persuade, you're free to try to convince your fellow citizens, but then we play the game. And, and, there, and then somebody wins that game um, and we accept peacefully the result. Um, and the, the, in exchange for peacefully accepting that result is you get to play again in two or four years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it requires our citizenry to be committed to those mechanisms of dispute resolution and the faith that even if they lost, they get to play again mm -hmm. uh, in a fair system committed to continuing to evolve, which is why, in my opinion, the most, the most dangerous thing Trump was doing was attempting to destroy the legitimacy of the electoral process itself. Mm -hmm. Because believing in that fairness of that system is the essential ingredient of democracy. Mm -hmm. And if, that, if we lose control of that, meaning citizens don't have faith, don't believe it's fair, don't believe it's, or do believe it's rigged, won't accept the results, then democracy is truly dead, no matter how much consensus we can muster on policy mm -hmm. prescriptions. So, you know, by the way, Duvall, I would say, the midterms heartened me in this regard. Yes. And, yes. and not, not just because, you know, a team I happen to favor now won, but because the liars so clearly lost. The mm -hmm. ones who attempted to convince citizens to elect them who propagated the lie, who insisted on the rig system. And more interestingly, when they did lose, most of them just accepted it. Yep. Now there's a handful who you know, Carrie Lake in Arizona continue to make a little noise, but most of them shut up about it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was the most heartening sign that there is a limit in our society to what our country will accept in that kind of fabricated attack on the system, the system held and people wanted it to hold and they punished those who wanted to tear it down. So you yeah, have something to work with. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And it gives yes. me great hope that this country goes up and down, but it grows more than most and it convulsively sometimes, but I'm still a patriot. Thank you. And Ed? Yeah, if you'll just excuse me for a minute, you know what I should have done at, at uh, the start of this was to invite our audience to submit their questions in the chat. And I hate to interrupt this flow, it's been fantastic. Um, here in this exchange, um, but we wanted to go ahead and queue up folks um, who had questions to invite everyone who's on online. If you have a question um, for uh, the commissioner, please just put it in the chat and um, I will uh, let the governor know and, and, and we can go from there. Okay, but well, let me ask one more then while we wait for people to tee up their, uh, uh, their questions. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about intergenerational leadership. Mm. Um, you, you know, you, you had uh, the extraordinary experience of uh, living under, being encouraged and tutored by an extraordinary leader, um, a, very, uh, a very public uh, uh, leader. Um, and there were expectations, um, you know, whether you felt them or not, but that we all had of you and your sister, fr frankly, um, that uh, 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 that I I know your parents and the rest of us feel um, you stepped up to and it made them proud. There is a way in which it feels like generationally 
uh, there's a there is a there are younger leaders trying to step forward um, and feeling in some cases blocked. Um, do you see that? And how do we how do you know it's time to make room for uh, for that next generation of leaders? Oh wow! Um, I, I'm I'm a passionate believer that that an obligation of experience, an obligation of success, uh, is to immediately turn to developing the next generational leader. I would say my personal time, even while I hold a full time job at the job and external to the job, I would say eighty percent of the time, mm -hmm. I now dedicate myself to helping young leaders find their way. Like mm -hmm. Ellie Wiesel once said, an experience not conveyed is an experience betrayed. Mm -hmm. And if I can't take my collective experiences and help uh, invest them in the next generation, then, then I, am, I am failing uh, in my responsibility as an elder. And I'm about to turn 60, so I'm gonna call myself an elder now. You watch, um, you watch yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> So, don't draw me in. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a I think it's a continuous thing. Um, and you know, the other thing my parents always taught me is um, uh, uh, no person is indispensable. Um, everyone has a time to leave the stage. Um, De Gaulle said the cemeteries are filled with indispensable men. You know, mm -hmm. it's not my job to create an environment that is intrinsically dependent on my continued presence. Uh, mm -hmm. My view of leadership, it's my job to work myself out of a job. It's my job to train my, my, follow, my, my subordinates, my employees to do my job better than I could, to grow, to have confidence that I could walk away from it tomorrow and it would continue to live and breathe and innovate and grow without me, you know, and I hope they uh, remember me, but they don't need to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it will be their time. And so I, I think too many leaders don't play it that way. I think they think they, they tend to get addicted to being the indispensable cog in the wheel. I think they right. tend to graspingly hold on too long. I think they tend to be unwilling to move aside when the time is ripe. And I think they don't think hard enough about what it means to be, I love this term nobody uses anymore, to be a sage, to be someone mm. who who really decides to make the second half of their life about wisdom, about you and me, we're taught this in Aspen, you know, to be about wisdom, values, and virtues, and how do we contribute to helping them have the tools to create a better world? And I, I think that's a very noble calling, and I think it's one that I'm excited to be a part of. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to go sit in my house in Cape Cod for the, you know, let other people <laughs> take on this messy world. So uh -huh. if you don't, yes, if you don't mind, I've got, there's a, this is a really, I think a great question, especially um, based on what you've just described to us is what you think, what a leader should be doing and how they should be inspiring others to take the reins and make it bigger, better, faster, stronger than they, <laughs> they made themselves. So, you know, we know where some of the pain points are with, with leaders in, in, in our country who's sitting, who sit in certain posts, but who would you say, um, you think models the kind of good leader leader that you just described. Who are some of the leaders in the country that you think are, are got it right? Um, there are a lot of them. You know, by the way, it's interesting because it can come at the strain of of popular approbation in the celebrity sense. I continue to be amazed at the sort of chronically low popularity ratings of President Biden, who I. You know, look, there's a lot in, in his administration I, I don't love, but I know him, I know him personally, and I've known him for decades. And I think he, he genuinely attempts to model the things we're talking about. I think he tries to address policy substantively, not superficially. I think he tries to do complex, hard things. Uh, I think he tries to own them in a principled, morally oriented way. Uh, I think he's ethically fair. You know, I think that that's what the kind of leaders I would want to see more of uh, and, and I, I see less of. And I think it's interesting that to be that kind of leader in, in a big public spotlight often comes at some expense. 
But you know, it's interesting if you go back and read Thomas Jefferson's second inaugural address, he talks openly about the fact that you will never, if you do your job, you will never leave office with the approbation that you entered it with. You will always be thought wrong by those who don't see the whole field. Uh, when I am wrong, it'll be just by error of judgment, not by intention. That's the price of great leadership, right? So, you know, I think he's one. You know, someone who you would not be familiar with. Uh, I am the chairman of the board of the Mayo Clinic. The CEO of the Mayo Clinic is one of the most outstanding leaders I've ever witnessed in my life, running the most complex institution I've ever encountered. Um, engaged in a mission that saves that that is noble and worthy to save lives to transform healthcare it to care about culture by the way was just voted uh, one of the top if not the top diversity employer in the United States even though it's housed in Rochester Minnesota now if you think you can't get a diverse population at your company then explain how they can do it in Rochester Minnesota when they're deeply committed to the mission. Um, I think that uh, he would certainly be one. Um, oh, you caught me. I can think of lots of people, but um, you know, they're out there. And I would say this, I, when I used to take jobs and that I used to say, I don't care what the job is, it's who I get to work for I want. And I try to teach 20 year olds that today. Like, I know you think you're supposed to be in this field, doing that job with that title. But the best thing you could do is under whose wing do you want to be tucked? And when you see these people that are modeling these things you admire, figure out how to get under their tutelage because that's transformational. Mm -hmm. uh, I took almost every job I've held until recently for the chance to work for somebody. And I didn't really care that much about what the subject matter was. And for me, that paid great dividends and I think Yes, they're out there and they're out there to be modeled. Um, well, I, I write a list of them. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that about, um, you know, finding, you know, someone who, who can, can guide you and help you to, uh, you know, on your, on your leadership path. But so let me ask you to take that a little bit further. What other advice would you have for young people who are trying to figure out, you know, how to become, you know, how to, how to, uh, become good leaders, how to advance in leadership, um, you know, in addition to having someone there to, to help, you know, to guide them under their tutelage, what else do, should they be thinking about? How should they be trying to form, you know, the kind of skills that they, that they're going to need to be good leaders? What advice do you give them? Yeah. Uh, let me think about that. I, I would put it in a few quick categories. If I, if I were sitting down in front of a, a new shiny bristling graduate, you know, looking to tear up the world, this, this, this is a little bit Buddhist. The first thing I would teach them is you have been sold a little bit of a lie. You will never find happiness simply chasing power, fame, money, wealth, and status. The world uh, doesn't work that way. It's not as meritocratic as you've been led to believe. A plus B doesn't equal C. You're going to have to learn to develop a sense of purpose, meaning, um, uh, worth, that lives separate from that. And mm -hmm. nobody's taught you how to do that, to develop a character, to develop what David Brooks calls eulogy virtues. I mean, we're, we're teaching kids to be resume rockets, right? They, they, they take the AP courses, they know the meritocratic game, they're killing themselves to get on the travel baseball team. I mean, boy, we've made a whole bunch of really fast moving missiles when it comes to resume development uh, and economic utilitarian achievement. But are we doing as good a job about teaching them the values they're gonna talk about at your funeral? Were they compassionate? Were they kind? Were they curious? Were they thoughtful? Were they a good friend? Were they good? And people think that's some kind of goofy softy thing. But let me tell you, every leadership job I've held that is hard or challenging the premium on that job was how good I did that stuff, not my technical knowledge, right? The difference between the knowledge point on the pyramid and wisdom is the inclusion of these other characteristics as a leader. Mm -hmm. When I was a soldier, I had to hold soldiers, you know, in the mud who had been hurt badly, who were crying, 
I, I had to learn what to do when a soldier's wife had had brought their baby to Germany and they were living on subsistence. I had to learn to care for soldiers. I'll tell you a story just because it means so much to me. The day I was deploying to Germany as a brand new lieutenant, my father, a three-star general at the time, came into my bedroom uh, to say goodbye. He woke me up, he leaned over, he kissed me on my cheek and he only said one thing. He said, take care of our soldiers. That's all. Like, take, you know, leadership is caring for people. It is mm -hmm. stewarding them. It's getting the best out of them. So I think learning that number one, all this shiny stuff that they're convincing you is your career is not actually your career. you got to find these other values. And when you do, and if you study them, whether you read Aristotle, the Buddha, or anything else, you will actually find out that's the key to phenomenal leadership. The other thing I would say is I think curiosity is a superpower. I, my son just had a baby. I'm a brand new grandfather for the first time. And I said, look, the only thing I can tell you about raising a kid, imbue in him a wonder, a wonderment and a curiosity of the world and the rest will take care of itself. Be a lifelong learner, wanna know how stuff works, never stop asking questions, continue to look at the sky and wonder why it's blue. Do that forever. And you will be constantly learning, expanding your horizons, learning by analogy, bringing creative solutions to work. It's not the technical aspects of the job that are hard. It's the integration of the lessons of the world into a, a system that cares for the people who want to follow you. You know, you just mentioned your your father and, um, you know, to echo um, what the governor said that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you all of the accomplishments you've had in your own right. We don't want to try to overshadow that um, by, by asking relentless questions about your dad. But let me just say, okay, I love them. but people, because we do love him, right? And and um, we've got some questions that have to do with with uh, with the general. Uh, one of the, the, you know, you just mentioned what he said to you about taking care of those people in your charge, right? And it sounds like that was a very meaningful thing, obviously for you. Um, the quite one of the questions is 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 what do you remember most? What do you take most from um, you know, your, your relationship with your dad, if you would share that with us. Well, I'll veer a little bit because I think we were, we, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you a, a version. You know, people always sort of ask, well, you know, when you were kids, what was it like? You know, were you up at five in the morning and, <laughs> and you know, discipline and reveille and a bunch of rules? I mean, our house had very few, if any, rules. You know, my, my, my parents believed in standards, not rules. And I remember they used to say to me, he used to say, I will teach you right, I will teach you wrong, and I will teach you responsibility. That's the end of my lesson. And I can tell you that my sisters would concur. I don't think they looked at a report card from the ninth grade on. Hmm. I don't think my parents could tell you what I did in college, grade-wise or not. And that was not disinterest or uncaring. Mm -hmm. It was, this needs to matter to you. Mm -hmm. You alone should set the standards of excellence for yourself, right? Only your own intrinsic motivation is going to lead you to excellence, right? You know, not me parentally leaning on you in this way. And, you know, if we did something wrong, occasionally happened, you know, if you showed up to my father and said, oh, I wrecked the car, there would be a pause. The only question is, and what did you do about it? Hmm. The only way you would get in trouble in our house is you took no responsibility for fixing the problem that you caused. Hmm. If, you, if I said, well, dad, I called the tow truck and they came and got it and I got it out of the street and, you know, I've got some money set aside, I'm going to do this and this is my plan for fix and pay for it, you would just get a nod and say, Okay, that's the end of it. But if you didn't have that, you were in a lot of trouble. So, you know, this idea of accepting responsibility, looking in the mirror first, holding yourself accountable um, before you blame others, you know, that was another thing never allowed. Don't you ever say a word about what somebody did or why somebody else was the reason you didn't. As my dad used to say in the colorful army language, the maximum range of an excuse is zero meters. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't want to hear it. You know, uh, 
These sound funny, but you know, they live with you forever. They make you better. Wow. All right, thank you for that. Uh, you know, we've got questions. If you'd like for me to continue, Governor, to sort of read off the ones that we're getting, I can do that. But if you've got something that sure. you want to get to, you sure. just let me know and I'll- I, and I'll, I know I'll how to interrupt, that. please. All right, okay, great. Um, so uh, someone's asking, how is wealth inequality in the US impacting our democratic institutions? I, I think profoundly. Um, in part because our political systems have so unfortunately become integrated with money. I mean, who are we kidding that, that wealth doesn't buy access, that wealth doesn't um, contribute to who, what political campaigns succeed and which ones don't? I mean, so that's one way. I mean, the, the, the democratic electoral process itself it is kind of riddled with the effects of wealth and money. So if you're on the outside of that, there's some, in some ways you're on the outside of aspects of the way that system effectively works. Um, you know, I continue to be sort of soulfully disappointed that we cannot seem to cobble together um, a national agenda uh, around poverty, a national agenda around wealth inequality. Um, by the way, I'm pretty critical of both sides of the political spectrum on this. Um, you know, on the left, you'll hear it cited a lot. Uh, you'll hear it um, fists pounded on tables talking about it a lot. Often I'm disappointed that that collapses into a kind of go after big companies and rich people and not particularly thoughtful about the needs of actual poor people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, th I think we've become very uninnovative and uncreative uh, about that disparity and how to address it. And I don't think either political party is doing themselves any great achievement at the moment around these, these agendas. And I think that's, that's deeply disappointing. I do think one consequence, we were talking about technology before, it has a very dangerous aspect of over-accelerating that divide. Because in a globalized world connected by rapid technology, you can now achieve supersized wealth across a global audience and set of customers. You know, Mark Zuckerberg can become a hundred billion dollar guy in a generation, right? If you just looked at the wealth of just the leaders of five companies, it would be stag, you know, stupefying the amount of wealth being concentrated by technologically fueled economics, right? And those economics favor knowledge economies. And I think the greatest challenge in America right now in the world, let me just end with that point, because I think this matters for white folks too. We have reached an era when you, you don't have as much opportunity to make a satisfactory living with your labor. Mm. The, the majority of American history, whether you're a, a white brawny guy or an average blue collar worker, you could be in the middle class through your physicality. You could work at Ford Motor Company for 35 years, buy a house, two cars, a garage, send your kids to college. You could work in construction. You could work in you know, a whole range of things and still be willing to expect and hope for a relatively deep. What's happening in the knowledge economy, and by the way, a lot of us who are the intellectuals who profit don't think about this enough either. We are killing the ability to make high quality livings from your labor. So we don't have a good answer for what we're doing with these parts. And they are tending toward more destructive directions as a consequence. You know, the great civil rights leader, Ruby Sales, public theologian used to say, you know, if she were young enough, she thinks there's a problem of how do you help those displaced white people find meaning in their lives that don't take them in destructive directions. Otherwise they're, they're quite ripe and available for those who will. 
And I don't think the answer, you know, is is working at Hotel Six. You know, we've 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 decided retail was kind of the answer in the short run to that problem. If you've seen what retail is like from a joining the upper middle classes, it's not particularly fruitful. So that's a big issue, uh, and I don't have some good answers for it, but I I do try to think about it a lot. It's, how can we be more creative about poverty? Mm -hmm. Um, generational poverty, it's horrific. And, and I'm going to be really controversial. I don't think Black folks think about it anymore. Meaning, you know, I have a lot of Black friends who have made it, you know, made it in any, we're very interested in all kinds of problems in the world. And I'm always a little surprised how infrequently we're sitting around the table talking about this. Mm -hmm. um, our own community. Um, that actually feeds right into another question, and and because we've talked about leadership in general, um, but um, one of our our um, audience members here is asking about what you think about the state of black leadership in particular in this country. Yeah, I think there I think there's some phenomenal black leaders in the country. I think there's some great leaders, uh, you know, leading corporate leading in the business sector who are, are quite effective, quite uh, excellent. Um, you know, Duvall and I have both been to an annual event where a lot of black CEOs get together, black leaders, and it's a pretty amazing and impressive group of people whose hearts are in the right place and they're doing great things. And um, so I, I, I feel confident that we have a lot of great leaders out there, you know, in the political system, you know, I think you can find people who I think you know, are admirable. You know, I'm excited about Wes Moore, who I know, you know, who just won the governor's race in Maryland. I was super excited when a guy named Deval Patrick uh, did the same thing. I mean, they are coming along and they are having success. Um, so I, I'm not morose about that, um, but is it enough? I, 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 I think like, you know, like in some zombie movie, we need to keep them coming, you know, at a horrific rate. <laughs> Um, to continue to break through and, and make that progress. But, but just as importantly, when they get there, how do we convert that success for longevity into the next cycle of mm -hmm. folks? And I still think we have a little work to do on that. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are, what are your thoughts on this? You know, with the, the, um, you know, the extreme polarization that we're seeing in the two major political parties in this country, um, do you think that is um, going to give an opportunity for the rise of other parties? Do you see that in our future? I don't really see it in the short term. Um, in a way, we do have, it sounds weird. We, we, if you look at these studies, you know, there's, there's six to eight distinct flavors of, you know, political opinion that sort of get forced to live under these broad umbrellas. Um, but in terms of the way the electoral system works and the way the money raising works, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what the governor would say, but I, I don't personally think that I'm gonna see in my lifetime, a third party that's competing effectively, you know, with the other two. But look, I think a lot of people are out there working on it for all the right impulses, the sense that they don't feel, you know, it's like me, I don't really feel that at home in classic political parties anymore. Do you need a home? The number of people increasingly identifying it as independent is going up. Um, there's a kind of dissatisfaction with what they have. That's right mm -hmm. for something. But what I hope it's right for is a backlash against the traditional parties in a way they're forced to uh, retrench and remold. If there's one thing I think politics is, it's a perfect market. They will, <laughs> uh, the political environment will move anywhere that will get you votes. And it's incumbent on us to reward what we want to reward with those votes in order to make the political market bend to what we say we want. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife's always screaming about politicians. I said, you know, look, we need to have a hard conversation about Americans. About because look, citizens. these people are the product of us and what we venerate. 
And if look, we're gonna sit all day tweeting and retweeting controversial content, the Marjorie Taylor Greene is gonna exist mm -hmm. because she's being paid to exist by us because we talk about her all day long. And that's all, that's the only currency she's actually after. You know, Santos, you know, he, he's after fabulism that he, but the irony is he's getting all the attention he so desperately craves. Um, the media chase all of it. Uh, you know, let's stop rewarding them with the thing they seek, which is focus attention and media coverage. I've got to ask you this is a question for myself. I, I, I just picked up a book that I, I'm finding fascinating, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to put your hands on it. It's called Winners Take All. Mm -hmm. Do you know that sure. book, the, the Elite Charade of Changing the World? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've had, had a chance to look at that, what your thoughts are on, on um, you know, what the, the author is, is talking about in terms of, you know, corporate America, um, you know, some of the, the, the largest um, uh, companies who put aside and dedicate lots of money for, uh, you know, let's say environmental causes and to help fight climate change and so forth, but they are some of the biggest offenders. And so they will do everything, um, you know, to uh, try to help a situation, but do nothing to cause no harm, right? They don't do anything that hurts their own, um, you know, uh, performance or endeavors or revenue stream. But, you know, while we're polluting and while we're fighting, you know, uh, you know, uh, emissions regulation and so forth over here, we'll also we'll, we'll set aside thousands of dollars on, or millions of dollars on this end to, you know, help clean the air or do something on, on, the, on the back end. So, you know, it's about, uh, you know, corporate America's role in, um, in the problems in solving the problems that they're creating or, or to not solve those, not to create the problems. Yeah, now that you mentioned it, I think I, I, I am aware of the book. I think I've heard the thesis and in fairness, I haven't read it so I can't critique the author, but my initial reaction is I don't really buy that in its, in its total sort of general application. Uh, I, I see companies every day, not only doing what you described to help, in terms of a social sense of social responsibility or philanthropic giving. But I also have seen many change processes uh, in order to effectuate change. I mean, let's go look at the air pollution of Los Angeles in 1975. Let's go look at the air pollution in New York City in 1975 in the 60s, absolutely pathetic. The, the evolution of improvement in those environments would not have happened if some corporation didn't change. You know, it probably, their own behavior probably lagged. It's easy to write a check. It's harder to change a business model that continues to be addressing the de demands of shareholders and profitability, but yet they're working, on, right? Like they're working on electric, you know, in, in the cable industry, for example, where we do truck rolls, they're working on converting the whole fleet to electric. Um, Amazon converted all of its delivery trucks to, I mean, there are things like that going on. We have enormous water uh, reclamation work going on in our companies, for example, um, you know, just in this sort of environmental category. And I will say in the wake of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests and greater awareness about anti-racism and systematic racism, I've seen a lot of institutions pay lip service, but I've seen a lot of them make pretty profound changes um, living. And one reason they do is because employees now demand That's right. more than ever to work in places they feel comfortable being associated with. If you ask my CEOs about speaking out on social issues, all of them will be a little bit frightened of the topic, right? You know, you go out there and get beat up, have DeSanto screaming. But what they will tell you is, I don't do any of that for, for public consumption. My employees demand it of us. I can't maintain my workforce. I can't recruit the next generation of talent if I don't have a soul, right? So they will tell you that these movements live inside of these institutions. And these employees, you know, even at my little job, 
you know, certain issues come up. The, the emails that start flying in my inbox about how we should never give another dollar to this pack and that, you know, we have to navigate that every time something happens. Uh, and I'm glad that we do. I think it continues to make us have a conscience. And so, yeah, there's some of that uh, and people shouldn't just write a check and buy their way out of it. But I think mm -hmm. it's interesting if you look at the data right now, businesses rank as almost the highest trusted institution in the country. Much higher than government, much higher than the Supreme Court, much higher than most institutional systems, probably only behind, although they might even be than the military. So Americans tend to look to these institutions right now for change, whether they should or they shouldn't. But I think they have more confidence change is being pressed in those quarters than they do by their government. Well, I really like that. I'm going to keep those th those thoughts in mind as I'm going through this book because that's a much more hopeful, um, you know, thought of, uh, on the subject. So thank you for that. You know, I'm I'm noticing that we are um, just about getting to our end time, and so um, what what I think I'd like to do is is to ask um, uh, ask the governor and the dean if they have any any uh, closing remarks they would like to make. And then, uh, and then you know, uh, of course, uh, give you commissioner the last word if you have any um, closing remarks that you would like to make. Well, maybe I, I'll start. I, may I, may I, may I, Doug? Uh, I first just want to thank you, Annette and, uh, and Rudy and all the folks from, uh, uh, from the BAA for organizing us uh, again this year. Um, you and I and Michael knows and the Dean knows that um, Black history is not just about one month, it is about American history and the examples of resilience and achievement um, that uh, emanate from this community as they have from so many others. And um, I think we have had an extraordinary example of that as a guest tonight. Um, Michael knows I am uh, firmly and have been for a long time a member of his fan club. Um, he has been wise beyond his years before he had the years to claim that he was a wise old man. Um, and uh, and I, th I think that was on display again uh, tonight. Michael, I'm so grateful that you made time for us all uh, and were as uh, forthcoming as you always are. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to offer my own thanks um, to, of course, my colleague, uh, Deval, um, but also to you, Michael Powell. Uh, what a amazing collection of wisdom you passed on um, to me and everyone on the call during this time. I had, I had not known you before, and I'm just thrilled I got this chance to listen to you and Deval talk about the challenges of the world and the things that good people can do to make a difference, which, of course, is the spirit here at the Kennedy School. Um, so thank you to you, Deval. Thank you. Um, and that's so thank you so much for hosting tonight. Um, this has really become a now, I guess the second year, really a high spot in the annual calendar of events that I get to partake in. So thank you. I think you're muted, Annette. I am. Thank you. Sorry. I was going to say, you know what? Uh, I have been um, feverish feverishly trying to take, you know, notes and quotes. Um, although I know this is recorded, but but still I wouldn't want I was writing this down. I will tell you, I not only has this, you know, been enlightening on on um, you know, so many levels around uh, you know, leadership and government and and um and action, but I I'm gonna tell you um that I think that what I've taken away this evening, I think is going to make me a better parent. Mm. And so I, and I, I, you know, in, in terms of what's important and what kind of people we want to create and send out into the world and, um, and some lessons for that. So I, so I, I love that. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your, your thoughts and your wisdom with us. Um, I want to thank, of course, the, the Dean and Deval Patrick for always being um, such great supporters of the BAA and being a part of these events. Um, the uh, Alumni Relations Office, uh, Karen and her team have been terrific in helping to put this together. So I, so thank you so much for your support. Um, and I think the last word needs to be with you, Michael Powell. You can you can send us off with with whatever last pearl of wisdom you'd like to you'd like to share. Well, first of all, just gratitude. I was honored to be asked. I can never refuse Rudy. So you you sent the right person after me. Um, I admire the work of the school. I've known it for a long time. I think you're doing great work. I think you're doing great work in important areas that the country needs. So thank you. 
Dean for all the things you're doing there. Um, I would just end with this, you know, losing my father was a very painful moment, but uh, it was a blessing to, to, to live in the home of a living black historical figure. And he always made clear to us, uh, he would have never achieved anything, but for the sacrifices of many uh, black leaders and those who went before him. He never failed to credit them for his success. Uh, he never failed to own the obligation to advance their legacy through his own work and example. Uh, and I think that uh, he taught me and my sisters that as children. And I think as a community, uh, if, if we live with the sacred responsibility to our ancestors, we'll continue to make this country uh, live up to its true creed. So I'm excited to be a part of that. And thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.